Stop, stop Welcome texting into debate Ricky night. Um, Brody says, Silas, stop texting Ricky Waisaki. Welcome into debate night. Um, <laughs> this is episode number two of our pre-recorded episodes uh, while we're out on the West Coast tour. So just a heads up if you hadn't seen the previous one. Um, this episode was recorded in advance. So if anything has happened that is absolutely insane and you're wondering why the heck aren't we talking about it? Like, why aren't you going to talk about Gannon Burr's uh, 22 under round or um, Katrina Allen uh, developing a steak allergy or something like that? It's because we didn't know it was going to happen yet. So that's why. Um, so just expect these topics will be a lot more broader uh, topics that we came up with that aren't super current events. And that's why uh, today we're joined by Brody Smith as always. Yeah, I'm here not for the points. I'm here for the YouTube comments. That's who I play for. Okay, I respect that. Uh, we're also joined by Robbie C. today. Uh, I'm here for the Tic Tacs. Uh, yep. I'm not sure what that means. Um, Hunter? I am here for the points, so I'm trying to think up as many puns as possible because that's what kept me out of the finals last time. It's true. And uh, we're also joined by Dustin today. Yeah, nothing catastrophic happened this past week, so I have no real witty introduction prepared. So it's just, okay. just me. I'm that glad is, I was able to influence everyone's introduction right there. Just you are an influencer. It's what these guys have been doing it a, a long point. time. Probably like, should get a point for that. Or he's been influencer for like You're thirty years. Your points go up. Uh, <laughs> he's just go ahead and pre get removing that point for you going over your time. So it's good all job, good. Hunter. Good job, man. <laughs> Give you a point for that. No, I'm just kidding. All right, we're gonna get into uh, we're gonna get into our topics. Um, this first one, uh, this is actually given to me by Robbie, who I believe got this from your birdie fam, Robbie. Um, or this might have been contrived by yourself. Feel free to take credit. Um, but this this question is. It gets brought up to us a lot on our mailbag podcast. People ask about this a lot because of the team centered focus that disc golf seems to kind of lean into sometimes, or at least the manufacturers do. And the question is if the pro tour introduced a formula one style constructors cup, and this is a situation where in formula one, if you're not familiar, the manufacturers are able to earn points based on their sponsored players performance or their drivers performance to earn money for their business. So this would be like, the players are still competing for everything they compete for, but imagine now Team Discraft has something at stake and Discraft has money on the table. Like they want to win money based on their players. Uh, so, my question if this existed in the sport, how would it affect disc golf? Can I get a clarifying question really quick just to make sure, sure I'm getting this right? Because I don't follow Formula One. So, is it the more points you get, the more rev share you get? Hunter, would you know the answer to that? The player? No. No, like the company. So, like yeah, if the, the company the, gets more points, the, they get more of the revenue share. That's what I'm guessing, right? Yeah, like at that's the end the whole of the point. season, you basically just have a payout. Okay. Yeah, end of season, basically just a payout money. based on where you stand in the Constructors' Cup. Yeah, basically, the manufacturer's right. team building would be a lot more important than just... Right, also, right, if, you right. fall, if you fall too far down, right, Don't you? can't you get, like, relegated too, or do they not do that? Can't you, like, lose, or is it more you just like you, don't, you won't have the funding? Yeah, you can lose going. funding because you won't get sponsorship basically yeah. on your yeah. car. If you're too far down. Well, in okay. any case, if the teams, the manufacturers had a, Williams, something Williams. like that at stake, Brody, how would it affect the sport? But I think someone actually is, has been doing this for a while now on Reddit. They've been literally doing a manufacturer cup or whatever, and they update it after every tournament. So this, this is already stuff that people talk about. This is, we hear people talk about this all the time of how cool it would be to have an event where it's like Discraft versus Innova, Prodigy versus MVP. Fans, fans talk about it. Uh, the manufacturers push the family aspect, the team aspect, the, the fans, I think a lot of them eat that up as well. So there already is a lot of this that's already happening. The issue, and I think this is an issue that Formula One has to you know deal with, is when you have two drivers under the same team in an individual sport, a lot of times there is backlash between the two because one will have a better car than the other, one will be told not to pass because this person has a better chance of winning the point. There's a lot of weird stuff. If you do follow formula one, there's a lot of weird stuff a lot of times between the two drivers. So even though they are under the same team, they don't act like teammates. A lot of them actually do not like each other. And I think that ultimately is, would be what would happen if this happened in this, in this golf is you would have this idea that outside of the players, Everything looks good. You're going to have people, fans, team Discraft, team Discraft. You're going to have Discraft go team Discraft. Team. But then the players under it, some are going to feel like, wait, I'm not getting pushed as hard as the other people. There's going to be weird stuff that we see in other sports. Cause again, this is an individual sport. It will be very difficult. I think to make that switch, 
But if we are looking to want more drama, which I don't know, I feel like some people don't want that in disc golf. I think this would add to that. I think more you would see more people getting upset of like, why is this person getting this and I'm not? There would be okay. a lot more of that aspect. Okay, so at the team aspect increasing, I see the point there could actually add more drama. Robbie, what do you think? Yeah, so to push back a little bit on Brody's point, one of the the hard parts of why the drivers butt heads with one another is because if we think about this, like they're literally driving at such fast speeds around, like there is imminent danger in them trying to pass one another while on the track. And so decisions have to be made there. Uh, we don't necessarily like that's not going to happen while we're out there on the course. I wouldn't assume. I mean, maybe when it walks down the line, they're not going to be like, all right, so Brody, you're walking into this last round with Ezra and you're currently ahead of him, but Ezra's stock is a little higher. So therefore, if it comes down to the final hole and it's you two on the line, we need you to lay up the putt and we need Ezra to drain the putt, things like that. I, I think if that comes down crazy. to it, that would be the drama. I mean, talk about the drama. That'd be a Honestly, that'd be insane to watch and so like crazy on the prediction standpoint. I think it would hook a lot of people in and I think it could create some, it could create even more loyalty for the manufacturers because of, hey, look how they're on, like they're staying very well balanced amongst their players and they're developing this. And I think we'd also, yeah, we'd see the ugly side of things a lot more. So I think it would bring honestly more of a visual and like a connection for fans to be able to connect with a brand rather than, Hey, I'm a fan of Brody and Brody's with Discraft right now. So therefore if Brody transfers manufacturers, it's, Oh, like if you go to formula one, people love the team managers uh, of their team. And so it just gives more hooks for the manufacturers to connect and create loyal fans with. Yeah. I, you, you can't really imagine a situation where the manufacturers wouldn't like it. Hunter, what do you think? Well, I'm surprised no one's brought this point up. If if this were to exist, each team would have to have the same number of players because it had to be 11 playing field. You can't have Innova with 45 players and Trilogy with two. So where I think this would really affect the sport is let's say that the limit was at 10. I think it would affect how many people are being sponsored and there'd be a lot more cutthroat whether you're sponsored or not. And then I think there's a lot more pressure on those players because if, if I'm 10th on Discraft's roster, I better hope that dynamic has a spot for me because the other thing that the constructors cup does is if you're not driving for one of the teams, you're not in formula one. So if you're not sponsored, you're not on the pro tour. It could be electric. There's a lot of this. that It, it could be, like, it definitely could. I don't think our sports there quite yet because like realistically, there's a lot of money that kind of goes around and would be involved with this. And I don't really think that's necessarily where we're at or where disc golf should head, but there it would, it would basically be a completely different sport. We wouldn't be disc golf anymore. We'd be yeah. a whole different team sport, but I think the big thing, it, it would be very electric to see who's on what roster going into each year, which players getting picked up, which players getting dropped. And then there'd be some players that, Hey, you just got kicked off of team dynamic and no one picked you up. You're just not a touring professional disc golfer anymore. Yeah. I mean, that would be, that would be a crazy narrative. The limited team slots. So bad. Dustin, what do you think about the constructor's idea? Uh, so first of all, I just hate this idea. I want to put that out there right away. But <laughs> if you. I'm going to speculate <laughs> on what this idea would do, uh, first of all, it completely transforms the business model because now it turns into a rev sharing model between the Disc Golf Pro Tour and manufacturers as opposed to like manufacturers paying to sponsor events and things of that nature. So it completely flips the market. Um, also, as Hunter was already kind of alluding to, it would definitely make player signings more cutthroat and there would be like a lot of bidding wars because manufacturers are relying now more on performance to get the bigger piece of the rev share i think it also changes the metrics by which you recruit players right because i think now it is going to be more performance based and less about your social media numbers and and your personal branding and things of that nature that might still be important to rep your brand but performance is going to become way more of a metric that is going to be gauged to recruit players um I think it also will create a situation where manufacturers kind of force their players into more of a team where they are wanting them to collaborate more, practice together more because they want more of their players placing highly as opposed to just one guy taking off and then the other guys lagging way behind because it's taken away from your points. Um, I also think it'll cause manufacturers to be more strict with how many events they make their players attend, right? If we, if we kind of keep it with the touring system, then all of a sudden these, these off weeks and things of that nature are going to be kind of a thing of the past. And I think it's just a net negative overall because Robbie brought up this like 
you know, like hypothetical scenario where you're being asked to lay up a putt so someone else can, you know, get points or whatever the case may be. And, and while it is still an individual sport golf, the fact that we even have to ask that question jeopardizes competitive integrity, in my opinion. Um, so, yeah, it's an individual sport. Leave it alone. But I think maybe team cuts for an exhibition style thing would be fun. Yeah, definitely. Brody, what do you have to say? Click the rebuttal, rebuttal button. Rebuttal uh, button. I, I'm just curious. Robbie, do you know about like player bonuses and like in the NFL? Do you know, do you know about that or no? Player bonuses, like in terms of how well they perform or like catching like, X amount of passes yeah, and things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm like, I'm sure it exists. So and now you have like, okay, I'm, so you, are they so targeting heard, this player more? No, no, I'm saying like, you've heard of the drama of like players not dressing for certain games, players not playing as much as they are because teams don't want them to hit bonuses to where they have to pay them more money. You've heard that from players in the NFL? Well, I don't talk to anyone in the NFL. Yeah, uh, no, I, mean, but, uh, <laughs> I don't have your status, my man. Social media, Robbie. I, post, I'm sure post, I've seen it before. It. Yes. Okay. So if they're doing that in the NFL, just saying like that stuff happens already in other sports. And to, to Dustin's point, the fact that people are just going to be questioning it, no one's questioning right now. Someone laying up, a, you know, even though there was some question about whether or not Ricky laid up that putt to let Mason Ford win that one tournament. Um, <laughs> there was, a, there was a little bit of that, see, oh. but, but after that, like just the fact that we're having to have that discussion, I, th I think this is a terrible idea. I think this would, yeah. I think this would actually be terrible for disc golf. It's a fun, it, it provided. Here's the thing, though. Immediately, all these ideas sounded like it'd be a fun field day for the media, but the players well, would be lit. miserable. <laughs> it'd be, it'd be, no, I think player like it'd be like live golf. It'd be like well, some of the golf. players would probably thrive. The players who are like always finishing towards the top would probably thrive because like the performance based thing would help some of those players that aren't marketable. Right. Um, because they but would not get, if you're like not if you're like if you, if you're think about like if you're Gannon Burr right you're like one of the best players but your team's not that good he demands a trade he's forced I'm a trade saying, I'm saying as the man here for the YouTube that's, comments I was trying to get people towards the the manufacturers cup guys I apologize <laughs> for the fire I was trying to get the people what they wanted my bad Gannon Burr me in the comments demands trade people. from Prodigy or will retire that like that it's would like be your situation where I don't think we really know what we want. And that, then you, and the, you think you know, you think you want this, and then you get it, and then all I of a know sudden I don't like, want yeah, it. I, don't want I agree with Dustin. I, don't I hate this, this I'm idea. I'm aware I don't want that. <laughs> yeah, I don't want it either. Um, I love it. Just, a, just a thing, to, just something to. Can we get negative about. points for Robbie for that? <laughs> I don't know. He's he's definitely teetering on the edge right now. Okay. Uh, going into our next subject, uh, Dustin and Hunter are tied at four points. Robbie and Brody with two each. Just uh, this one is. Um, I feel like this one is debated. Um, a little bit of, on Twitter, anytime I try to go after spit outs, because you people love tweeting like, oh, look at this awful spit out somebody got. People love talking about it. And whenever I've talked about spit outs, I've occasionally heard the argument that spit outs are just a part of disc golf the same way um, lipping out a putt or get like it's just the, it's a bad break that is almost part of the charm of disc golf, which I I. You know, I understand the idea behind that point. I have my own thoughts on this, but Mike, so my question is, are spit outs destined to be a somewhat charming part of our sport uh, in the future or a problem that needs a permanent solution? Robbie. As the beginner guy, I'm going to offend a lot of beginners here. And I will say that 95% of claimed spit outs are not actually spit outs. Play with people who are actually good at disc golf, and when the spit out occurs, they will give you the reason why it actually occurred. It was off center. It was too hard. It was too soft. Things like that, like learning to control your putt. So what it comes down to from the Pro Tour's perspective is we can say, oh, man, they have to modify their putt based on what basket they're playing to that weekend. I think there, there, I, there's charm that exists in this scenario. I think the charm goes to that. However, I do think that there should be a more standardized basket coming across so that players can learn how to put on that basket. I think it's going to increase scoring ability as players go through the Pro Tour. I think that definitely needs to, needs to be the standard. But at the end of the day, it's an imperfect target uh at so we see more spit outs occur on older targets so yeah i'm not trying to put mock threes on tour and be like wow that's amazing tyler love you dga but there's a reason we've updated baskets so yes there are bad baskets that exist out there for catching but i do i think that they're destined to be a charming spot part of our sport absolutely not but i think that spit outs will always occur and the more people want to claim spit outs it's 
95% of them can be reasoned away. It was a bad putt. Okay. Okay. Hunter, what is your take on the spit outs? Yeah, no, I fully agree. I think the majority of spit outs that are claimed and seen on the pro tour even um, have a good reason as to why that putt got spit out of the basket. Um, and I think that that it just goes with every sport. I mean, you think of basketball, you have some shots that toilet bowl around and pop out. You have lip outs in golf. You have, you name a sport, and there's going to be some type of good or bad break and they go both ways. And in disc golf, it also goes both ways because we can, for every spit out, I can think of a putt that shouldn't have caught that got caught. Uh, that's just kind of a part of our sport. I think what should be fixed is there are some baskets that spit out putts that should be caught. So like there are some baskets that a dead center putt that wasn't thrown that hard will sometimes be thrown right back at you. Not going to say what basket, but it's, you know, um, but then Wait, on the flip basket. side of that coin, I also don't think, you know, what basket, basket it is. No, I and don't. The other I'm side, bad with baskets. I'm bad T-1s. with baskets. Prodigy T ones throw discs back in your face. Mock X is that the blue catch band. Everything. Mock X's might as well be a freaking wide receiver out there, just ready for you to toss something at them. That the blue band. I think band both one? are bad. They make them blue, green, orange. You name it, they okay. make it. Okay. The, they Jones, have the honeycomb in the middle. Jones, I'm adding Jones like 15 bro. seconds to my time. Um, That's fine. The DGA Mock <laughs> X I think is on the other end of that spectrum. I also don't think we should go that route where they're just catching everything and you can't get a spit out because I think both are negative for the sport. I think a happy medium disc catchers, uh, even chain stars. I know Ricky just had a bad spit out hot take. It was a little too hot, a little too high and nose down. That's why I got spit back out. But I think that those kind of middle of the ground baskets, nothing wrong with them and spit outs that happen. Cause you put right or left, you put it right or left. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so, so far we're on the kind of the take that spit outs are just bad putts. Anyways, most of the time, uh, Dustin, what do you think about spit outs? Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to agree with what people are saying here. Like a lot of spit outs, you can find some reason for why it actually happened, whether it was due to being putted too hard. This increases when there's weather conditions, it's windy, and people feel like they're forced to putt a little bit harder to make sure that they're impacted less by the wind and really get in the basket. And that could create spit out problems. It's obviously not charming. <laughs> like, I'll take that right off the bat. Like, no one likes to see it. We all hate to see it. You hate to feel it as a player. Uh, and it is one of those situations where no target's going to be perfect. You know, there's always going to be some chance for some spit out. Uh, and this just increases with weather conditions and, 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 you know, the actual basket being used. With that said, I don't think we should ignore the idea of innovating design and, and, and materials and things of that nature to try to improve some of these dead center spit outs or something along those lines. But then this kind of brings us to that whole crossroads that I think Hunter almost opened up, which is like, do we want to increase the difficulty of putting by changing these targets by making them smaller or having smaller sweet spots, things of that nature? I personally think that you could increase putting difficulty just by changing some of the rules of putting without ever touching the target. For example, let's get rid of step putting and things of that nature, and then putting gets way harder. Um, but either way, even if you wanted to go that route of making targets harder, I do think dead center spit outs need to be figured out as best as possible. Um, you know, through innovation and through advances in design. And I do think that the Disc Golf Pro Tour at Elite Series and higher events should have a standardized target that all players know about ahead of time. They can all be preparing on that target. I know this is going to cause controversy because, you know, certain manufacturers make baskets and they want their baskets to be seen. But I do think that this is a very unique situation where no other sport that I know of has unique targets like every basketball hoop you're going to go play in the NBA is the same height. It's the same type of rim. It's everything. So like we, we shouldn't be having this differentiation problem in disc golf. Yeah. Good point there. It is very weird having different targets, like vastly different, like not even not a lot of, sometimes there are baskets that look not even close to the same Brody. What do you have? It's a money issue. That's why it's happening. Um, I agree with, I, I agree with Robbie. I think what Robbie said, 95%, of spit outs are not actually spit outs. You see it too when you're playing on the pro tour with people in practice rounds and stuff of where they, you know, oh my God, I can't believe that that didn't stay in. Um, I I was kind of in that illusion as well a lot of times of where it's like, oh, I'm just going to blame the basket for me missing that putt. But I've come to realize like there are certain putts that should make it 99% of the time. And then there's certain putts that are 50-50. And if it doesn't go in, you can't blame the basket. You threw a putt that was 50-50. It's sometimes going to catch. It's sometimes not. The ones that are kind of crazy are, were you guys, Hunter, were you talking about mock threes? Is that what you were talking about? I think that was Robbie. Robbie that was, yes. oh, was that Robbie? Oh, okay. There's a course, like there's a really, really old course in Portland. I think it's called Rockwood. It might be like the or oldest course in the area or in the state, actually. And they have mock threes there. 
and I was putting, I was doing putting practice the other night over on the, the basket. I mean, it is wild how many putts do not stay in the back. Like literally just hit, cut straight through out the back. And I think that is like the big thing. We Those putts, if you can eliminate the ones that like hit chains and then go vertical and then go out the back, those to me are the worst. But if you go like high right, high left, hard with a lot of spin and on hyzer and it doesn't stick, like that to me is a 50-50. It's going to stick. Sometimes it's not. So, but yeah, it's a money, there's a money thing. Yeah. The, the reason why we have different targets is a money thing. Yeah, no, cer- certainly uh, you would think that that would be something they would have moved towards if they, if it was easy to budget. My whole thing with the spit out argument has always been, it's an interesting optic situation. If like the world championship winning putt with like a record breaking audience is a dead center spit out and that person oh loses. Gosh, Cause I like we it. would understand a lot of, a lot of people would understand why that happened but to new viewers to disc golf it could be an ugly look um and while i understand that uh baskets may never be perfect to dustin's point the disc catcher for example consider probably the premier basket that exists or one of them has not changed in how many years 20 years like i don't i don't think anybody's trying to innovate baskets and it's the most important part of our sport arguably if we want to fix it Aaron Gossage, shout out to Aaron Gossage. All we need is a pole. Okay. Get rid of the basket. Just have okay. a pole and have it have like the fencing technology of like when something touches it and it counts that that's the Aaron Gossage take of how to fix putting. It's literally just have a pole that like has a, uh, electro if field you, kind if of you took away the chains from the sport. I think like half the people playing disc golf would quit. <laughs> Just because oh, really? <laughs> it's just like people love the chains. I get it. Like I love, like, I mean, if I, if That's I was just going back to tone, poles. you gotta shake, you gotta shake the chains when everyone uh, gets a birdie. That's where a Ain't nothing from. like banging them chains. If baby. I was, if I just was throwing into a pole all day, I think I'd get pretty sad. What if we just keep the chain noise yeah. though? That, that, that would be what I need. Oh, I need a speaker. You need that satisfaction. Yeah. You know? I need this. It's I need like in, in hockey where it like has the buzzer. It's just the chain noise. Yeah, there you yeah, go. Exactly. Everybody gets their yeah, own yeah. chain noise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, I don't like that. Right. I don't like that at all. I'm not, I'm not liking this idea, but I'm not sold. This this episode is very open ended. If you haven't seen, uh, <laughs> and it's going to get more open ended. Uh, heading into our next subject, Dustin Hunter tied at six, Robbie and Brody at four each. Um, this one I think is kind of interesting because uh, we always talk about following in golf's footsteps. It's very easy to take things from golf that we should follow along in, uh, because obviously we are descendant from that sport. Um, but my question is. Which sport should disc golf be imitating in order to grow other than golf and why? And this could be something uh, like structure, rules, anything from other sports. That's something that we are not really taking advantage of uh, necessarily. Hunter, what do you think? Yeah, I was, uh, I was trying to think through this one. And I think it's important, like when I was trying to think through rules and stuff, golf is just the one that makes the most sense. So I was like, what do I experience at other professional sporting events that I don't experience at disc golf right now. And the big one, we originally brought it from golf when we were talking about it at the PGA tour. But the more I thought about it, you see it in pretty much every other sport, which is a lot more unique advertising integrations. And I don't think this necessarily grows the sport immediately, but I think it it is a increased retention of people coming back to events. Um, For example, you go to a basketball game. A lot of times you see, like a bank or something have more integrations or, or like a t-shirt companies throwing out free t-shirts, every three that's made, or you have that like three shell game with a ball, or you have like fan cameras at a basketball game. Like you do this at every sport. You can go to a sporting event and pay it. And the integration isn't just signs on the side, but it's stuff that enhances your fan experience. And this was especially beautiful and especially true in golf, which makes me think it's even easier to implement in golf, but it's something that every other sport's doing but disc golf, a lot of times, the sponsorship integration is like, yeah, you can vend here, and we're going to put a sign up on the fairway or a feather banner, and that's it. So I think some more creative sponsorship integrations would increase fan experience um, and, in the long term, grow the sport because it would keep retention high on people going to events. Certainly. Very good point. Dustin, what do you think? All right, so first I'm going to preface this by saying that this may require resources we don't currently have, but I'm like kind of projecting in the future a little bit, so kind of okay. kind of bear with me here. And I'm bringing some esports stuff over because I'm an esports guy, so it's just kind of natural. All right. and, and maybe we already are starting to get enough resources with this new Jomez Pro acquisition, this Golf Pro Tour, but I think we need to experiment with a hybrid streaming model that's similar to esports, but not completely. So right now, esports is basically free to watch, which creates a ton of viewership. Barrier entry, zero. This gets you a bunch of eyeballs, which helps you when it comes to advertisers and sponsors 
sponsors being interested because there's just more people watching, right? But esports does have a revenue conversion issue kind of going on right now. Um, Cause yeah, maybe you have lots of eyeballs, but it doesn't necessarily always lead to revenue. So I do think that some version of pay-per-view model needs to stay, but I do like the idea of having a hybrid model where maybe you have one stream that's always free. That way you can get those numbers for the ad and sponsor side, but then you still have a pay-per-view model for those diehard fans who are going to be willing to pay for a subscription uh, to get access to more coverage. So basically think of a mainstream that, you know, follows all the action uh, like lead card, all that jazz, you get that away for free. But let's say you want to follow your favorite card or your favorite player or something like that, then you pay extra to have that extra access to like an additional stream that has that type of stuff. But again, that is going to require more resources. This also opens to another idea that I think we're sorely missing that I see in esports a lot that I think is great, and that's co streaming. So this basically allows. Uh, you know, like in esports, like pro players or big personalities to basically watch the main broadcast on their stream and they get to interact with their fans and stuff like that. And it kind of introduces their fandom to the, the main broadcast and things of that nature. And that's still numbers you get to bring in as a disc golf pro tour when you're, you know, pitching your decks and things of that nature as well. Um, so I, I really like those ideas from the broadcast side. Some other things here right at the end. I would like to see more officials at elite and higher events instead of making players make the calls. I, I just think that that's a weird thing that you don't see in most other sports, and it seems to cause a lot of headaches. I think at least at the most elite events, we should be having more of that. Uh, and I do like si Simon Lazat standstill concept. Like, since we don't really have rough, I do like the idea of having standstill only zones, but all the rest of it's maybe a little too much. Okay, I like I like the esports concepts. It's you know that's another niche sport that. We, I would, I would say esports isn't niche as far as people that play video games, but as far as people that follow, it is definitely falls into that more niche category. And it's one that we don't really ever think about, but they're kind of on a similar place as disc golf and have been where they're trying to grow a sport um, as well. So that is a good point. Um, all right, Brody, what do you think? Yeah, I, I love Dustin's take on that. I think that needs to be implemented like as soon as possible, put the live coverage, the feed that they're going to show every shot, they're going to show all the, the packages. They're going to do all that stuff. Put that for free. Make that to where everyone can watch that for free. And then if you want to watch, if you want to watch every single shot of lead card, if you want commentators specifically for lead card, if you want audio specifically for lead card to where now we can hear the conversations between the players, we can hear the conversations between the caddies, have those as pay-per-view separately on the app that you have to pay for. I love that idea. I don't know why they're not doing it. That seems like a no-brainer. I actually think you'd even get more people potentially to pay into that idea for certain tournaments to see how people you know interact. And then obviously you'd have to create the way that they currently film lead cards and stuff. I don't think it would work where the cameras would just like drop when they're like not, you know, you'd have to have someone constantly on. You'd have to have something to where you have coverage. But that's a great idea. The other idea that uh, Dustin was talking about. Um, I'm blanking on it, but the pace of, uh, yeah, the coach stream is not bad. I like that. Additionally, I was going to say pace of play. I think right now the product, the product of disc golf is way too slow. The amount of people that don't watch live is not because it's uh, they don't want to, or whatever, they don't have time. It's too long. If you look at other sports, they are all doing baseball. Just did a huge thing with pitch uh, with the pitch clock. They're trying to find ways of speeding up the game to keep the inter people's attention span. Like right now, there's a bunch of people watching this. They've already tuned off. I've been talking too long. People's attention <laughs> span are shortening faster and faster. So you have to be quick. You have to show shots. And right now, disc golf, a lot of times our coverage is almost the same length of a PJ tour coverage. And we're showing like a third of the shots, like the amount of entertainment you're getting. Secondly, if someone answer me this question, if I'm opening a buffet, how do I know how much food to make the first day I'm opening? Based on other places. places. <laughs> because if, I, if, I, if I think that I'm going to have like a, a thousand people Fantastic show up, to, if I think I'm going to have a thousand people show up to my buffet, I'm, I need to have a lot of food ready. And then only 50 show up. Something to think about. And the fact of like, the pro tour, you put all this money into something that you think is going to help you make more money, and then it doesn't, it flops. I there's, don't know. There's I, certainly risk reward. I've always wondered how the buffet works. 
How do you open a buffet? <laughs> I thought you were going to like wrap that point up by like telling I was, us. I was really <laughs> waiting for the, like, I was like, where is this going? Like, I yeah, still this don't know is why. Um, okay. Well, I, the pace of play is a very good point though. Robbie, okay. what do you think? What should we be taking from other sports? Man. Thank goodness. I was really worried. I had a really terrible answer prepared in case someone took this one. You got the last. buffet answer. Uh, you? It, I literally was going to talk about why Golden Corral is the marketing genius uh, that we <laughs> all need. Uh, competitive eating. But uh, thankfully, don't how does go Bucky there. start? How does how do you start Bucky's? Uh, yeah. Franchising. Uh, so no, the first one. Oh, yeah. No idea. Uh, I, I mean, you're in Texas. And you're just like, let's just be bigger than everyone else. I guess like, that's right, Bucky's play. Let's just hope there's a hundred million dollar investment works. But speaking of hundred million dollar investments, the real sport we need to be tracking is a sport that pretty much every pro, uh, not every pro, that's, that's pandering. Go. It's uh, lots of pros already on the Disc Golf Pro Tour are trying to become professionals in as well. We got to talk about the ball of pickles. It is going, it is one of the fastest, if not the fastest growing sport in America. And why is pickleball growing? One, because it is easy to get into. You have a sport like tennis with a high skill ceiling. Lots of racket sports can be really overwhelming. Pickleball has easier to use tools. At, you can play after like one warm up volley in pickleball, and suddenly you start to become competent in playing it. Smaller course, smaller fields. So I think that we need to take that idea of welcoming players into the sport via what pickleball is doing and say hey like look at the look at how easy it is to come play this come enjoy it uh, i think that leads to easier like more equipment being available i think more shorter courses being installed everyone's talking about installing the pro courses left and right because we need everyone wants a championship level course because everybody wants to have a pro tour in their town that's just literally not possible but if you have more of the tiki courses existing if you have more easier courses people get into it another sport that we're going to look into and you know what everyone wants disc golf to be the most legit thing in the world but here's my real hot take i think we need to look at curling Oh, heck curling yeah. is such an amazing sport. Did you know that there are over 250 local curling clubs across America that host weekly yes. curling matches? Uh, and so yes. it's a great opportunity for you to get into it. And people, when curling comes around to the Olympics, everyone goes nuts. Like if you got hardwoods in your house, you're practicing curling. <laughs> what if we could embrace and, and like turn disc golf into the model of man, I'm folding my laundry and I got a little practice basket over there, ball these socks up. I'm banging putts left and right. Like what do we need to do to get disc golf in our homes? Like curling is in our hearts. There's many baskets, bro. We already got them. I mean, definitely there, there is it. something about curling, but I think curling is just the way they yell um, whenever that rock or the stone is uh, moving towards, I think that's what gets Bro, people into curling. I think we could bring it's, that it, to disc golf so easily. Like someone's making a putt, and you're like, go, 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 go. Like, yeah, shuffling I, through Robbie, the air. I'll, they Robbie, found I'll some kind of recipe. I'll, I will give you a hundred dollars if you can name one person on the gold medalist Hot. USA curling team. That's there's, a great question. There's I one that you would know. I, Brody, I, I didn't say I was into curling. I said that the world <laughs> is. John, isn't it his name John Schuster? Yeah, that's the captain. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, curling. there you go. Let's go. Points to Trevor. Points to Trevor. Matt, Matt Hamilton was the one. Th this is the. This is for those people watching. This is the guy that was the most famous because he had a sick stash. Yeah. Like a, this is trying to like totally Harry see that. Is that another <laughs> thing we need to bring in? Better <laughs> facial hair to disc golf. That's Matt Hamilton. We gotta harness the magic of curling and disc golf. I, I love that because you're right, Robbie. They. There's something about it when it comes on TV. It, it's people because love we curling. see it once every four years, Trevor. So maybe that's what hey, we should do. Hey, you've argued against is, that in the past. Let's, let's do one tournament every four years for disc golf. That's how we get people really excited. Well, you curling just said, still, you just said curling happens. does weeklies all over the place. Yeah, so curling that's still not their model. Year round. It's just the major boom every four years. Yeah. Yeah. And then no one cares about so it. So backpedal. Um, all oh, right, no, moving what? on to our next. You, you're just wrong. Moving on to our next subject. <laughs> <laughs> no one cares about. That's how you. That's how you get Are the there? show moving. You just tell someone they're wrong, and you yeah, get to the next question. I'm just starting to realize I can do that. Wait, do you know yeah. why curling? Do you know why curling is really popular at these weeklies? Because I'm, I'm pretty sure none of you guys have ever gone to one. So my, do you guys know my why? dad and my mom both have. They were really into it. Where my dad was. <laughs> well, now this is awkward, but I mean, putting leagues are the exact drinking. same way. If Drinking. you drink and, and curl, you're going to die. True. 
No, that sounds what, like the worst combination what, ever. You're going to have a concussion. More active. That's really what these places are. They go, they play a game, then they come off and have a drink at the oh, bar. You're saying they, afterward. Yeah, but that's literally. Well, that's like, that's, have you ever too. been to a local putting league, Brody? <laughs> they do that's what your local breweries. putting league yeah. is entirely. You're just describing more, a lot of recreational sports. Active, uh, that's what I'm saying. Are there drink, more active drinking, curling drinking players or active disc golf players? Now we're talking. That's great. I, I think disc golfers. In the U.S., probably disc golf. Just yeah, because well, we really can, take growth can, points from something that's not growing as much as us. I agree. I think it was a terrible. I think it was a terrible point. I, I, agree. Uh, I, agree. Got, I think it was too. You can take. They've got magic. I think I Robbie really deserves a spicy. point just for attempting to bring curling into the. I did. I gave him some points. I think we could go with like I'm magic, pro, call, magic the I'm, gathering tournaments. I thought right, everybody, everybody, shush. My boys have to stick together, Robbie. Everybody, shush. We're moving on to the. We're moving on to the next topic. Dustin and Hunter each have eight. Robbie and and Brody right behind them at seven. Moving into the last one, uh, which is kind of ironic, um, given the episode. Uh, <laughs> but I think that the the first that. topic here, we started talking about a hypothetical in disc golf. And just because the hypothetical was providing situations that could induce drama and news, we all kind of got a little excited about it. We're talking about the implications. And sometimes the news cycle can get a bit dry, even in the middle of a disc golf season. Now, we have had a lot of interesting things happen via lawsuits this year. Yeah. But a lot of times, disc golf... The players themselves, you know, it's not like the NBA playoffs right now where somebody is talking trash about somebody almost every single time. There's storylines left and right. It gets a little dry sometimes. So my question is, who does the burden fall upon for creating more storylines in our sport? Is it the players, the pro tour, or the outside media, or somebody else even? Dustin, who do you think? Everybody's just got to start suing everybody, bro. We need all the drama that we can get. This is exactly what we're talking about right here. Just go ahead uh, and then feed it up. But no, in, in all seriousness, it's all of the above, right? Like all those pieces have to work together. You know, it says like it takes a village to, to raise a child. Like we need everyone in the disc golf community to be able to raise the sport up. So players creating content is huge because that's going to give you more insight into who they are as a person, helps grow fandoms, helps people get more invested. They like to see the behind the scenes stuff. Like, so it's just like extra bonus content basically to allow us to get to know the space better, get to know the players better. And you know, players need to take that upon themselves when it comes to creating content to do that. I think manufacturers are also a part of that. Like, push your players more. Like, there was a while where we weren't really seeing manufacturers create a whole lot of content around their players. Trilogy's always been really good about this. And even this year, we had, like, the Matteo and Sai Ananda practice rounds from West Side with, like, Ace Run Productions. And that's awesome because, like, that is, again, letting us see their personality. We're getting their insights and their mindsets. And, like, we're learning more about them, which means we get to be more invested in those players when we go watch them perform on tour. Uh, so I think that's huge. I think the outside media creating content's also big. Like, I like these putting games. I think GK Pro did, like, a Jeopardy thing. Thing. like this is just really cool stuff where we get to see players thrown into new environments and and therefore we get to just see different like variety of contents we're not watching the same old thing um I, I won't lie like watching 80 practice rounds from the same course from all the different players who are recording practice rounds that can get a little bit stale so seeing this different type of content can be really cool i'd also like to see more documentary right. content um, because like, it's one of those things where we see like the little small Jomez bio sometimes in the beginning of their videos, but I like to see more of that stuff just in general across the board. And then finally, the last thing I'm going to talk about something like a little personal to me, actually. So the tour needs to be doing better about how they put out content. Most of it's behind the paywall, get it away from the paywall, get it out there so that you can promote, uh, your events and you can get people promoted to DGN. Like I hosted and wrote a tournament recap series last year. And it got canned because it got no viewers because it was trapped behind a paywall. But it would have been a perfect way to advertise the tour if we were giving tour recaps <laughs> for free from the Briscoe Pro Tour. Like, like, why are you doing this? Like, put that content out there to help advertise the tour. So final point, it, it takes everyone. Everyone needs to be out there trying to promote the sport in different ways with content, with coverage, and things of that nature uh, to, to get things going. Shame on the Pro Tour for, for canning that. I would have liked to hear took it. took half my salary I was making from last year. Like, help out. <laughs> Robbie, right. Ro Robbie, Dustin kind of sounds like one of those pros that like misses a, a a putt and blames it on the basket. You know what I'm saying, man? That's that's screwed <laughs> up, bro. That's that's the. <laughs> I'm about to. Wait, I'm about, about. Do I need to leave? That didn't make sense. That did make sense. Brody, what are you? What are you? Who, I was I was joking at the fact of saying that you got no viewers because it was behind a paywall. That was that was the joke. That's a pretty Missed good reason to not get eyeballs on something. It's the because it it, it wasn't the uh, it was a bad basket. 
Uh, I know one got my fine analogy. Did. I did get well, it. I think Robbie person. also got it, but just didn't want to jump on the Hunter, bandwagon because he appreciates me. Hunter didn't get it. it that's that's normal. Uh, All right, Brody. I get? Other than your analogies, Brody, how who needs to be creating the storyline? I mean, we should story? really be talking about this buffet situation. I think, but <laughs> oh, here um, we go. We uh, no, I think I think Dustin's right. I think it has to be a combination of all three. You see. When you actually get into a sport, so whether it's golf, football, basketball, I don't care what sport it is. When you actually get involved in that sport at the, the pro level, you start realizing that a lot of times, like the commentators, a lot of times the media make these big hyperbole things. Like, oh my, like a lot of times in golf, they talk about how far people hit. And you see that in the disc golf pro tour too, with commentary. A lot of times they'll say like that drive just went 550 feet. Now, the part I don't like in disc golf is a lot of times they don't know actually how far it went. So they're just saying it went 500 feet and we all know that it only went 400 feet or whatever. That's weird. But there's times in golf where they'll say like a drive went 350 yards, and, but they're not telling you that the fairways are lightning fast and the ball's rolling out, but they, they build up these players. Like that is the pro tours job is to build up these players to make them look way better than they actually are. That is their job. It's the player's job to, you know, show up to either press conferences or, you know, whether it be on social media or when they're playing, they, they have two, they have two routes. They can either do it through their play and their performance and be very entertaining because of how good they are, the type of throws they throw. Um, you look at someone like, um, you look at someone like a Chris Dickerson, I would say, or even Calvin, you know, Calvin's kind of come out of his bubble a little bit, but Calvin was a perfect example of this a couple of years ago. Didn't really show that emo that much emotion, but his skill level spoke uh, spoke for itself, right? And so people were drawn to him by how good he was at disc golf. So you can go those two ways, and then the outside media's job is to basically take what the pro tour is doing, take what the players are doing, and then amplify that as well. And then do what we kind of do on here is speculate, come up with different talking points, throw things around to get people talking. That is kind of how you create engagement. That is how you get people excited to watch tournaments. You know, have we, um, again, this is so tough because this is two weeks in the future or whatever. But one thing that, to Dustin's point, I agree with him. I think the Pro Tour right now puts way too much stuff behind the paywall where they should be putting stuff. You know, we don't, we should be seeing like a lot of like, I don't know. I feel like we should be seeing like more of the press conference clips and maybe people aren't asking good questions or players aren't getting good answers. But a lot of times they do these like four hour long press conferences. And like, if you don't sit there and watch the whole four hour live thing, you don't see anything really from the press conference. So yeah, I agree with Dustin too much stuff is behind the paywall and uh, kind of goes back to what he, his point too. So, you know, send Dustin through to the finals, not me, but we should put certain things behind the paywall, but right now where we're at, we need to try to get as many eyeballs and people interested in watching and tuning in. And when you have to like, say like, Hey, I have something really, really cool, but you have to pay for it to get it. That sometimes it's hard for some people to like jump into it. If they're new. Good points. Good points. Robbie, what do you have to add? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that the players are, the players are integral in it, but the players do not need to be the ones coming up with the, the news and the cycle and all that the players need to be able to focus on being players. And when we can come alongside them, obviously in the evening, the players aren't out there. Like they can't go practice the course at night. So maybe they are practicing putting or doing whatever, but there's a, there's awesome content opportunity there. I think the pro tour is on the way to doing it correctly. You talked about putting things behind the play, the paywall, the D like the disc golf pro tour or uh, the disc golf network app. I think they thought it was going to function like Netflix. Like people were going to jump in and browse it. And oh man, instead of open, yeah, instead of opening Netflix or Prime Video, I'm going to head over to the DGN app. And oh, look, Dustin hosted this series. And I've seen Dust over on commentary. Whereas really, we open that app three times a week and it is to watch round one, round two, and round three. So like no one explores that app. And when you open the app and it's not where it needs to be, it is such a frustrating process when you're like, oh man, MPO should be on right now. And no, I can't find it, but I'm watching Cascade open from four years ago. That footage is available. Like that's a bummer. Uh, so can't get from the navigation on the app is rough. 
Yeah. So I think that's kind of lame uh, for sure. But outside media, I think honestly, we've seen one of the biggest reasons we've seen the jump in outside media production this year is because you have Ace Run jumping on and filming more cards. So how those companies can make their money is we have more opportunity for more filmed cards on tour because they can also capitalize with the players to make more content because they're around like just being someone who went to one pro tour event this year i was able to get multiple videos out of one trip from just being around and so if you're creative which you have to be to be successful in these outside media companies i just think it's very it's very doable we just need more people around good advice for gear girlfriend as well robbie just that, it does help to be around. Uh, or you can go like the Matt Teo route and just find a fake one. Wow. Crazy, oh, crazy stray. That was, uh, that was the crazy said. That was the meanest thing said on this Crazy podcast. stray. Didn't he just get catfished and it wasn't like he made it up? Yes. And there's like a very yeah, heartfelt okay. documentary yeah, about was how his entire Dang. career. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. You know what? I'll, I'll go ahead. You, Robbie C's not a nice guy. I'm going to take a point away from that. Oh, my gosh. Oh, okay. uh, that was uh, incredible. All right, I'm Hunter. Glad that, that's going to be the cover other than, story. Ro- other than Robbie C, where do we get the, play, the story lines from? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that there's a key difference between storylines and content. So Thank story you. Storylines, I think, falls solely on media. And I'm not saying outside media because the Pro Tour has the DGN and they handle the press conference. So media in general, which encompasses the DGN. And I think that the big thing is like, yeah, players can create storylines, but players need something to create storylines on. In other sports, we see it a lot, but a lot of times what players are creating storylines around is they're reacting to what something said about them because they weren't tossed a softball question in a press conference and where this falls mm. on the pro tour is brody's 100 right i'm not sitting through a four-hour press conference i have before but i'm not going to week in and week out it's important for the people who are sitting there and producing it just to go ahead and clip it you have nico saying at whatever it was like the keyboard warrior thing that whole that thing good. like that thing's got to be clipped i had to go clip that to make a tiktok out of it from the original youtube video that thing should have been blasted everywhere and if it wasn't for me it might not have been that's the thing that should be happening week in, week out. That should be blasted. You're and then what can happen is media can talk about it, players can react to it, and now you have a lot of storylines being generated, a lot of stuff to talk about. But the basis of all that, even though everyone's involved, is the media in general, which encompasses part of the Pro Tour. Since Dustin, do you have a retort there? It's not a retort. It's just that the, the Disc Golf Pro Tour does indeed clip out parts of the press conference and put it out on their social media outlets. Maybe it doesn't happen as much as it should. I just want to point out that it does indeed happen. It's it does, not like most, it's completely I think, absent. I think the key the here key is quantity. Yeah. The problem with it is most of the questions are like, oh, most yes. of what, I think I'm delayed, I but most of them is, is uh, the questions being asked are softballs. Yeah, sure. I, I, I don't know where I, I don't know what I'm responding to at this point because I just heard like just 10 different example. things at 10 different times in my I remember, ears. But yeah, I just remember the example that I have is they did clip out that one thing where like Paige Pierce was talking about how they took her stuff out of context about wanting to win and stuff like that before I think that was the OTB open and that did get spread like wildfire um, yeah. and, and, and stuff. So well, like it does happen, uh, but it could happen more. What about Isaac Robinson's spirit animal that he wants to play around with? I think that's that is information that we need to know. That's true. Here's a side thing I would say, though, too, is right now, and this can be taken as a good thing, but right now the media wants to be friends with every pro, everyone in the DGN and the pro tour. Not me. So they're worried Not about me. they're worried about what I'll light this cut. might paint someone I'll, in. I'll be I'll, I'll literally cut you. Dustin just saw it. I just cut him right here. He's on <laughs> no, my podcast right now. You're not the media <laughs> physically right now by that. I'm in the media. What are you talking about? I have a podcast. Well, I guess. Right you have so many people. Right now you have so many people that are worried. I'm very delayed, so just tell me when I can talk because I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I'm extremely delayed. Right now, you have a lot of people that are talking and are so worried about what people are going to perceive. And like they're like, oh, I can't, I can't take this out of context. Even though, like, for instance, there is something said on Tour Life that very easily could have been clipped out. But for the sake of the person who said that thing, it's probably for the best we didn't clip it out. But like stuff like that, <laughs> you can't be worried about what people are going to think of you when you know someone said something that can be clipped and that can be ran with. And right now people are worried about like, how am I going to be perceived? Am I going to be still friends with this person when I see them next week? So, and so media is too intertwined into, yeah. into everything's going on yes. in disc golf right now. We need a separation you, of media so that storylines can be pushed. You have to, you have to ask the hard questions. And, and also I think you do get respect from players. Like 
it was it was it awkward asking Emerson about like the scandal that he did with his like online form review? Yeah, like it's like not like super fun to ask that question, but at the same time, like you're giving them a, an opportunity to clear the air and and make a statement on it. There's there's positives that can be found on both sides, and I agree with Hunter. Right now or in the past, we've had too many people that just want to like never say anything, tell everyone they're so good. And they're awesome and they're great people mm-hmm. and never like just challenge anyone. I think right now you have to like challenge some people, ask but some tough questions. Here's the situation right now. The people asking questions typically at these events are pro tour employees. Yes. A lot of them, a lot of times they're literally friends with the pros. Um, the difference is what's happening right now. And if you follow like ESPN or sports center, so many of their posts are quotes from players, especially when there's like a a playoff series going on. Like right now you could probably find so many from like Jimmy Butler, for example. Um, What's happening is you have these reporters at these press conferences that know that their job is to get a catchy thing said. They want a soundbite. That is what their job is to do. So a lot of times what will happen is they'll ask a question that may even sound outrageous, but they know it's going to get a soundbite. It does. And then all you're going to see is sports center posting that quote. They're not even going to post the original. A lot of times you'll see the quote and then you'll swipe and you actually hear the context and be like, oh, but that is like the current cycle of things. And right now, nobody in the pro tour is going into those press conferences. I don't no. think they're thinking I'm going to go after the best soundbite possible Put me because out they're, foundation. Put me out they're there, scared baby. of what my people and, might think of them. And also, if you think right now too, like the, the, the podcast that have been around the longest and are listened to, you've got the Nick and Matt show. Nick has uh, worked with, I don't know if he's still, but has worked with the Pro Tour. You have Smashbox, Terry and uh, JV. Um, I always get his initials wrong. JV but, uh, and JVD. Yeah, JVD. Those guys work literally with the Pro Tour. And then you've got Alti World. He also does commentary for the Pro Tour. So, like every, yep. all, all those three podcasts. Those are nice. all intertwined. And so like, you don't ever really want to do anything to upset your employer. So um, yeah, it's, it's a weird situation for sure. For a lot of those people, I'm sure to ch- have to like draw that line. That yeah. is a massive point that Brody just made, by the way, like they're like, that makes it difficult to have individual media when they're also on the payroll. At this golf they're, pro all tour. Basically, they're, they're essentially all, if the pro tour, I don't think this is happening, but if the pro tour is like, Hey, we really need to start pushing this they could theoretically have all those people push that narrative for them. Yeah. And all of a sudden foundation nation, baby, the media doesn't look like it's supposed to look kind of where it's just free media. Say what you want about the media and provoking questions, but it does create most of the storylines that I see in sports a lot of times, because even it, even if it's just getting a player to say what they're already thinking, using a provoking provoking question, or my favorite is mentioning something that another player said about that player. Like that, that, that is, this is the, these are the keys here. And I think that that, that just doesn't exist right now, but it's something that would be not that hard. Um, because if you put the right person in those press conferences, they would say some shocking things. Robbie, you uh, do you have what it takes, Robbie? Bro, I'll do it. Okay, give me an give me example. That, give me that. Give me yeah, that give, media pass. Here, yeah, here, give us an example, wait, Robbie. I'm sitting here right here. Give me a question. Go. Yeah, give Brody a question right now. <laughs> just, just, just well, I, got a question. I got a question for Mr. Smith. Wow, oh, taking, 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 you're losing your job already, Robbie. Hunter's taking it for yeah, guys, guys, I have time to prepare for these press conferences. <laughs> the right questions require preparation. That is true. Good question, point. Mr. Smith. That is a good point by Robbie. Give him a point. What's the question? Yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know if you heard recently, but Paige Pierce was on record saying that she would beat you on average and be rated higher than you if she were to transition to NBO. What do you think about that? There is a video, I believe, on YouTube that um, I think it might have been a year after I started playing disc golf where me and her played a match play for nine holes. So if you want to see what that would look like, you can just watch that video. <laughs> there you go. Most interesting thing that ever happened in a pro tour press conference right there. I mean, it's that simple. Everybody, everybody take notes. Robbie, do you want a chance at a shot or are you, are you sticking to the prep? <laughs> I'm going to stick to my prep. I'm going to stick okay. to my prep. I catch, me, that. catch me next respect. time. Next time I'm on, uh, it'll be next time I'm on debate night, but before I get my media pass at the pro tour. Okay. Also, we that. don't know. We don't know if Paige, <laughs> we don't know if Paige did not win DDO MPO. We do not know. We don't. 
So we could all be looking real silly right now. That is true. This is two weeks. True. That is true. true. That would be phenomenal. What a (laughs) a story that would be. That would would be the greatest story ever. That would be a good story. All right. We're moving on to the rapid fire round. Dustin and Hunter are moving on. A tale as old as time. Let's move on to the rapid fire round. All right. Sorry, we actually have a player with a lead going into this rapid fire round. Doesn't always happen. Dustin has a lead, which means you will get a choice. Do you want to go first or second? Uh, give me the box. Okay. He wants the box. All right. He's up by one. Uh, first topic here. We're going to do a little buy, sell, or hold. Uh, we used to do this quite often. We're bringing it back. And I think this is a pretty intriguing player. The idea is if you had the option of either owning Stalker or would it be, would you buy, sell, or hold stock in this player? And that is Valerie Mandahano, who we now know is returning at DDL. Right. So basically she was coming off injury and she hasn't played yet this year. So kind of a mystery, but we do know how she was last year. So with that said, I'm going to hold. And the reason why I'm not buying is because I don't think her stock fell that much. I think people do realize she's still a fantastic player. Just hasn't had the opportunity to play yet. So I think her stock's kind of where it's at. And so I'm going to hold on to it because I know what she's capable of. She had an excellent 2022. She won Waco. She won Portland. She had a silver win at the Beaver state fling. She was a consistent top 10 finisher. Uh, throughout the tour, had plenty of top fives to go along with it. And she's like one of those people who actually could consistently contend for the win. Uh, she certainly has the skill set and the work ethic. I know this personally. Like I was at, uh, you know, open at Tallahassee, a silver event, and I saw her there practicing all the time. Like, so I know what her work ethic is from just like a personal observation. So I'm definitely holding on Valerie okay. Mandahano. Yeah, good points, Hunter. Buy, sell, or hold. Yeah, so I'm I'm uh, leaning into, I think Dustin had a good point, which we have to go off of what we do know. And what we do know is the current field. So I'm going on to, I'm going into buy. I'm going to buy Valerie Mandahano because I think she's stepping into a pretty wide open FPO field in my personal opinion. I think that she is primed to be one of the only players in the FPO field to contend with Kristen Tatar week in and week out. And I think that she's stepping right into a spot that has number two player in the world waiting for her with a chance at moving up to number one. And that's a player I want to hold stock in. There are some questions regarding the ankle, but surely after five months recovery for a six to eight week ankle injury, she's at 100%. So I think that she's ready to roll. I think she's going to come into DDO and pick up right where she left off last season in a more open, in my opinion, FPO field. Okay. Well, I will say the one thing about the ankle injury is I think being away five months makes it uh, raises the question. Surely that wasn't a just a three to four week uh, ankle injury, but we'll, we're going to have to get more yeah. info on that. We, we, yeah. Um, all right. Moving on to our next subject. Dustin's still up one point. Hunter, you'll lead off here. Um, this is a overreaction or underreaction. And the statement is Chris Dickerson's best golf is probably behind him. Hunter. I definitely think this is an overreaction. Chris Dickerson is still a young player. He's a proven player on tour. Sure. He's getting a little bit older, but the, the, at the, at his best, Robot Chicken is just that. He's a robot. At his best, he's one of the best putters in the world. At his best, he's one of the best fairway finders in the world. And at the right courses, this guy could pop off and win on the East Coast two or three times this season. So I think that it is definitely an overreaction to say his best golf is behind him. There's no reason to think that. He's in a little bit of a slump. It's not that crazy. He's just not the player we thought he was last year. But last year, we were contending, comparing him to like the top five players in the world. So for him to fall off slightly from that... For one season, there's no real reason to think he's not going to come back and possibly even supersede or exceed our expectation of him from last year. So I think that's an overreaction. Okay. Overreaction or underreaction, Dustin? I'm also going to go with overreaction because I feel like the only two reasons you'd argue that his best golf is behind him is A, you're going to argue some type of age argument, or B, you're using some type of recency bias based on the slow start to this season, which I think both are massively flawed arguments. He's only 30 years old. We're seeing Matteo play some of his best disc golf ever, and he's 33. So, like, we know that Dickerson still has years left on him to play some great golf. Uh, it might be tough for him to win another major. So, like, if he never wins another major again, then I guess technically that was his best golf. But I do think he's going to be a continuer going forward. He was a consistent top 10 player last year. Uh, he had wins at a major. He had several top five finishes, elite events. Uh, he only placed outside of the top 20 a single time last year. So that is consistency. And look, I know he had a slow start this year, but he still did have some top 15 finishes at Champions Cup in Jonesboro. And he's just inactive right now because he doesn't play the West Coast swing. So once he's back in action, like I think the Tennessee, like, well, this is going to come out way before that, but he's going to get to play a little home event at the Tennessee State Championships where he always does very well, get that little bit of a boost and then get back on tour and do a good job. I think, I think he just has the skills, experience and a, and a crazy resume uh, to prove that he can still compete at a high level for a long time. 
I, I will say the, uh, you know, to be fair, the resume and last year's stats that is behind him. So, I mean, that does, that does Again, kind of he had two top 15s this year already. So but I, I mean, that's, I, that's with I, him. I would agree overreactions at this point, but it is, uh, it's something, you know, it's something to consider is that, you know, they more so more than him getting worse. It's the idea that his level of golf last season, um, you could argue it just, it's just hard to ever get back to for any player of any caliber. Um, that would be more so, I guess the argument there. Um, but moving on to our, our last subject here, um, Dustin still with a one point lead. Um, this is the question about Paul's European trip. And I think this one, a lot of people take differently, but it is what does Paul need to accomplish on the European pro tour to make it a successful trip? All right. So first off, it defines on what do you mean by a successful trip? Because we all think that the reason why he's doing this tour is to expand his brand in Europe, maybe network some stuff for future foundation projects, help expand the disc golf brand or disc craft brand overseas, excuse me, as well as the sport. And in that case, simply showing up is going to accomplish all of those goals and therefore can see the trip as a success in some metrics. Now, if you're talking about performance wise, Macbeth has had a slow start this year. All right. There's, there's no getting around it. He has, even the last few events he played before he left have been well below what we expect, particularly the major, I think was the, the crazy one. Cause we all feel like he goes McBeast mode for like those big, like more uh, prestigious events. And that didn't even happen for him as he heads over to, to Europe. So that's the issue. So on the eat PT, Macbeth will be by far the biggest name, and most accomplished player at every event and probably the most skilled player. Uh, there's going to be a few events where like Nicholas Antela and Bradley Williams and Jacob Simrad and a couple other guys will be present, but he will be the big name in attendance at all these events. I think he's playing like, like six or seven European pro tour events, like somewhere around that number. Um, I'm not saying he has to win them all, but he's going to need to win a few, like to, to make it successful as far as performance standpoint. And I feel like he can't be finishing outside of the top five, like not when the name that he's going to have. And, and, and the fact that when he comes back, he's only going to have like five or so months left to put up results that, that are going to be meaningful because they're going to be back on the actual elite or, or better disc golf pro tour event. So yeah, I think he's got to come out of this with some victories. Okay, Hunter, what do you think he needs to accomplish? Well, I think for the event, for the trip to be successful in Paul's mind, like Dustin said, he's just got to show up. Uh, because I think in Paul's mind, this isn't about performance. I think this is about growing his brand, growing Discraft's brand, and just spreading the word of the Paul and Beth Foundation over there. I think that's what this trip is about for him. But for it to be a successful trip in the eyes of the media and the fans back home, I think that there's a few specific things that have to be accomplished. Um, First, you said European Pro Tour, but I'm including the Pro Tour event and the major in this. Uh, right. First, I think that he needs to win the European Open. I think that that is one of the key things that needs to happen over there. This major works very well for him. I think winning the European Open, that already begins to flip the script. Prior to the European Open, he needs a solid performance at PCS, which is a full Pro Tour event, but I don't think that's a necessary win. And the events leading up to it, I think it's a podium or bust. Uh, I think he's got a podium at at least all of them. And let's just say, I think it is six. I think he needs to win four of them. I think he needs to win four podium at the other two and then win the European open. I think that is a very successful trip on a performance standpoint. He comes back into that with a very solid chance of having a good rest of the season. Cause we are heading into the Macbeth branch of the season when he comes back. Um, so I think that's what makes it a successful trip, but realistically in Paul's eyes, it's a successful trip really is like no matter what happens on the so course, because it's all about the appearance. My question is performance based. You said he has to win the European open. If he were to win all of the European tour events and the PCS, but not the European open, not a successful trip. Successful. In, well, in my mind, the success of Paul Macbeth season is he wants to be in contention for player of the year. And I think the European open is his most likely, uh, chance at a major for the rest of the year. Um, that's just what I personally think. I think that's the one he's going to be the best at and most likely to win. So I think that is what makes it a successful trip with the end goal of being player of the year. Okay. Okay. Fair argument. Fair arguments from both of you, but ultimately Dustin is going to hang on for this episode and be our winner 18 to 17. Um, doesn't help that Hunter's internet is <laughs> absolutely atrocious yet again, somehow. Um, he'll, he'll hear that comment in like three seconds. It's not my internet. I have like 500 down, 500 up. That is so true. I have no idea. It's it's something. My computer doesn't like Vito Ninja. I have five times faster internet than our office right now. Dang. I think it's your computer. It just blow up the, I it is. I blow up it the is. team. Um, in any case, hopefully you enjoyed that episode. I think we went on a lot of different tangents that were pretty fun. Uh, Dustin, what do you have to say? All right, so I've won the show several times, and so far I have yet to do a shameless plug. So am I allowed one freebie? Maybe. Yeah, go ahead. All right, so I do have a Disc Golf YouTube channel. I have just surpassed the 900 threshold. I'm approaching 1,000 subs. 
So if you'd right. like to see some really awful disc golf to make yourself feel better about your own game, then head on over to Dustin Disc on YouTube and give me a sub if you wouldn't mind, so I can hit this a thousand. Goals. Well, Appreciate we'll leave you. it. We'll leave it in as long as you give us a shameless plug in return. It's, okay, on your it's channel. Funny, yes. It's funny. It's funny too that you uh, you did I actually that. wear your merch all the time on my channel. So. Well, there you go. There you go. It's it's funny you did that, Dustin, because I, I do not feel bad go. by the uh, the joke I, I I threw your way. I do and not feel bad at all. But <laughs> I was I actually did just follow you back on Twitter, and I was going to promote your Twitter. Which is follow dust d u s t. Make sure you check out follow dust on Twitter for some uh, disc golf hot takes. There you and go. And lots of esports stuff, but yes, some disc golf is in there for sure. There you go. Um, all right. Hopefully you enjoyed this episode I'm of debate sorry, night. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, no Rob, you're not coming yeah, back from that. You can't come back from that. 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 You're not that coming back from that. The worst thing that's <laughs> happened on this show all time. <laughs> you can't yeah. go back from that, Robbie. I'll tell you what. Yeah. It, <laughs> next uh, next week on debate night, we'll be back in current times. Just one more reminder, in case you forgot, this is a pre-recorded episode. Next week, we'll be back from the West Coast and back into present day. And hopefully, there's all kinds of fun stories for us to come back to. Um, I'll add to that. Hopefully, if anything that crazy happened while we're out on tour, we, I'm sure we hopped in a Twitter space or did something to cover it. Um, but other than that, we'll see you next time with another episode.